Five-time NASA astronaut Mark T. Vandehey returns to Earth after a record-setting 355 days aboard the International Space Station. That duration puts Vandehey ahead of the previous 340-day mark held by Scott Kelly, and while not quite as long as Russian cosmonaut Valery Polyakov's 438-day stint aboard the Mir in the mid-90s, Vandehey's accomplishment is still one of the longest continuous trips outside of Earth's atmosphere in spaceflight history. Van de Hey returns to Earth a changed man. No, not like that guy from Species, or those folks from Life, or that other guy from Alien, or even those nice orbital researchers in the Suicide Squad. No, Van de Hey's body has not been hijacked by any alien symbiotes that we know of, but it has undergone foundational adaptations to microgravity during his year spent in space. These changes are not uncommon and in fact have been studied for more than half a century by NASA's Human Research Program, which investigates the effects that microgravity and the rigors of spaceflight have on the human body. NASA uses that information to better design spacecraft and life support systems accommodating the astronauts of tomorrow. As humanity's expansion into space accelerates in the coming decades, more people will be going into orbit and beyond, both more regularly and for longer than ever before and while they're out there, they'll invariably need medical care. Even getting into low Earth orbit is a strain on the human body, as the sustained force generated during liftoff can reach 3 Gs. That's triple the pull of Earth's gravity. The human body can withstand massive transient G-forces, those produced by sudden starts or stops, like a plane or a car crash. In fact, the record for transient Gs is held by Air Force physician John Stapp, who once survived a load of 46 Gs, though it did kind of temporarily leave him blind. But the human body can only withstand a fraction of that if it comes as sustained G-forces, such as those produced by a spacecraft's main engines during acceleration. Untrained civilians will begin feeling the effects of these forces at around 3 to 4 Gs, but with practice and support equipment like high-G suits, seasoned astronauts can resist the effects until around 8 or 9 Gs. However, unprotected human bodies, they can only withstand around 5 Gs of persistent force before we black out. Now, most astronauts will also have to deal with the effects of space adaptation syndrome once they escape Earth's gravitational pull. Without gravity, fluids in the body will migrate from the legs up into the torso and head, causing swelling, puffy facial features, nausea, and vertigo. The average space traveler will eliminate around 2 liters of urine in their first 48 hours of weightlessness as their bodies adapt to the new environment. But it's not just excess water that they're eliminating. Astronauts also pee out parts of their own skeleton every time they hit the head. On Earth, the constant pull of gravity and the effort required for us to move around causes our bodies to adapt. Our bones grow more dense and our muscles grow stronger as they respond to their environmental strains. Take away the gravity and you also take away the signaling effect that our cells rely on to know whether they need to build more bone and muscle or not. Without those sensory inputs and the environmental stressors that would normally prompt the body to maintain its current level of fitness, our muscles will atrophy up to 40% of their mass, depending on the length of the mission, while our bones can lose their mineral density at a rate of 1-2% to every month. This leaves astronauts highly susceptible to bone breaks and kidney stones upon their return to Earth. They're generally looking at around two months of recovery time for every month spent in microgravity. In fact, a study conducted in 2000 found that the bone loss from six months in space is equivalent to what the elderly experience during a decade of aging here on Earth. Even intensive daily sessions with the treadmill, cycle ergometer, and advanced resistance exercise device aboard the ISS, paired with a balanced nutrient-rich diet, has only shown to be partially effective at offsetting that. And then there's the space anemia. According to a recent study published in Nature Medicine, the bodies of astronauts appear to destroy their red blood cells 50% faster while in space than they would here on Earth. The human body will produce and destroy around 2 million red blood cells every second while in gravity. However, that number jumps to roughly 3 million per second in space, which researchers believe is due to fluids shifting in the body as astronauts adapt to weightlessness. We're also beginning to see evidence that astronauts' brains are rewiring themselves in response to microgravity. A study published in Frontiers in Neural Circuits investigated post-travel structural changes found in the brain's white matter. The study used MRI data collected from a dozen cosmonauts before and after their stays aboard the ISS, each averaging around 172 days apiece. Researchers discovered changes in the neural connections between different motor areas within the brain, as well as changes to the shape of the corpus callosum, the part of the brain that connects and interfaces its two hemispheres. Again, fluid shifts are the suspected culprit. So as the transition towards commercial spaceflight accelerates and the orbital economy further opens for business, opportunities to advance space medicine will increase as well. 
Right now, government spaceflight programs and installations are severely limited in the number of astronauts that they can handle simultaneously. I mean, the ISS holds a whopping seven people at a time. This translates into long, multi-year queues for astronauts waiting to go up into space. Commercial space ventures like Orbital Reef will shorten those wait times by expanding the number of space-based positions available. This in turn will give institutions like the Center for Space Medicine at Baylor University more and more diversified health data to analyze, helping a new generation of medical practitioners obtain the skills necessary to keep tomorrow's commercial astronauts alive on the job.